My name's Rona Mellor, the Deputy Auditor General for Australia. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and the people in whose countries we meet around Australia today and acknowledge their elders past and present and a special welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who are joining us through this proceeding. Thanks for making the time to come to our end of year wrap up. Um, we've got uh, what I call a hearty agenda of things to talk to you about. Um, a number of senior people from the ANAO have made the time to share thoughts, learnings and issues with you today. Uh, first of all though, I thought I'd just give you an update on some issues from the ANAO, um, including some changes um, that we've been going through, some of which you may have noticed and some of which you may hear for the first time. So Grant Hare, our Auditor General, has now been with the uh, ANAO as Auditor General for Australia for two and a half years. He's been driving a change agenda within the organisation to help us better meet our purpose under our law and increase our impact and become, like you, more productive. Uh, right at the moment, we're working on the next year's Ford Work Program. Um, th what does that mean for you? Um, nothing much yet. We're using um, an integrated risk assessment process based on our work through financial statements auditing and assurance auditing. We've got uh, going through a period of strong engagement with the parliament uh, to drive its priorities. And we will start engaging with accountable authorities and as we did this year with the public. So for those of you who don't know, this year we published the draft audit program on our website and invited comments from the public and we did get some. Um, through the year we quite often get uh, requests for audit of your agencies and broad public sector issues and we will continue to look for public input to our, um, our work program. Of course, all of that input then gets assessed um, and as you'd know, the Auditor General has ultimate discretion on what he audits, but we will put out a program on the 2nd of July next year uh, covering uh, both uh, individual audit topics within portfolios and cross-entity and other topics. Another development under this Auditor General is greater transparency um, in the ANAO as an agency. If you are, and you should be, a stalker of our website, um, you can learn a lot from our website, um, perhaps about yourselves, but perhaps about others. Um, we publish the Auditor General's expenses on our website. Um, we publish briefings that we give to the Parliament. Um, so you may not be aware that every year we circulate prior to your agencies appearing in estimates to every senator a summary of all audit reports. Um, and we go and brief parliamentarians on audit reports. We also get invited to brief parliamentarians on particular topics, and we get invited to brief committees privately on topics. We publish information about all of those briefings on our website. We publish it, our gift register. Um, like most of you, although not all of you have done this, um, publish executive remuneration. Ours is audited externally, and there will be more to come. We're working through um, most of our policies and procedures to determine we're not covered by the IPS, the Information Publication Scheme under the FOI Act, but we're working through what is good transparency for an audit office to have. Um, if, if you've got your phone there, I've been told that you must now go to Twitter and follow us at ANAO underscore Australia. Why is that? Because every time we publish something, we, we tweet about it. We don't tweet about your agency personally, we just tweet about the fact that we've done something. So it's a good way to follow what's coming out of um, the ANAO. For a tiny little agency, 3,000 3, followers now, I could get another 100 today. It's not a KPI, but if you've got your phone, I uh, encourage you to do it. For those of you that follow um, our product set, including the audit reports in uh, financial statements auditing, you'll observe a redesign of audit reports uh, for performance audits, shorter in a Q&A type style, many more graphics, standalone executive summaries, so parliamentarians can get pretty much everything out of the first five or six pages of an audit report. We've started to do assurance reviews under ASA E3000. Um, we've tabled two so far, one on the Malabar rifle range leasing arrangements 
and the Auditor General decided to do some further work uh, following the Four Corners program on the Murray Darling Basin water distribution and we've decided to do our assurance reviews of that nature under that standard and table them in the Parliament. We get a lot of letters from parliamentarians asking us to audit your business um, and the Auditor General will decide whether or not we've got the resources or it's a priority, um, but now we'll start uh, using that standard more to table reports. Uh, another new product um, that you'll see, in fact one tomorrow, uh, which we're tabling tomorrow, is more information reports. Around the world, audit officers quite often uh, reach out into data sets and present data in a certain way, um, just as a factual summary of what's going on. We already do a number of information reports, like our controls report and our end of year report that are summaries of activity. Tomorrow we're going to table uh, an information report which slices and dices public Aus tender data. It slices it by entity, by category of expenditure, and we don't do any auditing or opinion. Um, I expect that if this one's well received in the Parliament, um, and we know that procurement is a high priority for the Parliament, that the Auditor General will look for more, uh, more opportunities and uh, Jocelyn will cover some changes in the organisation that take us towards that. The Auditor General, um, I think you'll be aware, wanted a greater coverage of our mandate. In the last year, we've been requested by the Joint Committee to look at the performance of GBEs and corporates, um, and we've undertaken performance audits in Australia Post, uh, Rail Track Corporation, uh, More Bank, Intermodal Company, NBN, um, and some of those have been tabled and some are coming. Um, we've also been asked to audit cyber security in GBEs and corporates, and that's sitting on our program and will kick off probably in the new year. Um, we also developed a methodology for measuring efficiency. Um, we hadn't, as an organisation, we'd really focused on effectiveness. Um, and through our new standards area, we developed a methodology for efficiency and in the last year of audited Australia Council and Australia Post for efficiency. More of that will come too. One of our key performance focus areas is more engagement with the Parliament. Um, interestingly, the Joint Committee of Public Accounts held an inquiry into our end of year report last year. Um, I, I expect that they'll continue to do that because, as you know, the end of year report isn't just a summary of your um, performance in financial reporting, but also the Auditor General chooses to make insights in there about the sector. Um, I expect that they'll just continue to be interested. There were some agencies they were particularly interested in. Uh, they asked us a lot of questions about the difference between moderate and significant findings. And they asked us a lot of questions about our processes. Um, and so I think there's a, an audience there of interest for the work that you do and how it's reported in the Parliament. Uh, we make submissions to almost any committee that's doing an inquiry on something related to an audit that we've done. Our submissions are based on the audit report itself. Um, and so in the last year, you know, we, we're up around 60 submissions and appearances in the Parliament. As I said, we circulate our audit summaries before the estimates hearings. Um, interestingly, in the last two estimates, estimate sessions, we were asked to appear in your committees and explain things um, from the audit perspective, and we expect that will continue. Another key focus area for us is using our uh, performance auditing to support strong implementation of the performance management reform agenda. And as you know, the PGPA review is underway. Many of your agencies have made submissions to that review team. Uh, our audit coverage has been around corporate planning, risk management, and um, we're fi uh, finalising uh, right now the assurance, a uh, second uh, performance audit assuring performance statements. Um, we're also looking at the timing of annual reports um, as a key parliamentary interest area. Um, in a lot of submissions that your agencies have made, you've suggested that we're a blocker to that. Uh, we have data that uh, we'll share with you today that might suggest otherwise. Um, interestingly, in the performance statements area, you might be aware that the Auditor General's discretion to audit performance statements before they're tabled, so just like um, what we do with your financial statements, um, is, is cut across by section 40 of the PGPA Act and requires that the Minister for Finance requests that to happen. We obviously can do performance audits, um, but we've been having a look at what 
the landscape looks like in the event that the Minister for Finance did ask us to do that, to, to audit your performance statements prior to the finalisation of your annual report. Um, it might just be of interest to you that they're in the controls entities, the ones that we do the controls reporting on, so the major departments and some of the large um, corporates, there are 643 KPIs out there, which is a lot, um, an average per entity of 29, but interesting, a range that goes from single digits up to one d department having 29 KPIs, um, an interesting audit landscape for us to consider. Um, Better practice guides have uh, now become a thing of the past for the audit office. Uh, better practice guides uh, were a really important product of the audit office at a time, probably a paper-based time, and a time when some of the regulatory agencies didn't pump out as much really high quality informative information as they do now. The Belcher Review uh, recommended uh, that we withdraw from that space. Uh, the Secretary's Committee endorsed that and the Auditor General agreed. Um, so from 1 July this financial year, uh, we removed uh, the vast majority of better practice guides from our website. There are four under consideration with Finance and Prime Minister and Cabinet at the moment. And that's provided us with an opportunity, but a challenge as well, as to how to disseminate our insights and learnings from our audit program into the sector. Um, so Jane will speak a little bit about that today. One of you will. <laughs> they all just looked at me, no. <laughs> um, and lastly, um, a question I quite often get asked um, when I'm out and about is, oh, who audits the Auditor General? Well, there is, yeah, <laughs> there is an external auditor of the Auditor General. Obviously, we need to have our financial statements uh, audited um, for PGPA purposes. And about every two years, there's a performance audit on the audit office. Yesterday, um, our external auditor tabled um, an audit into cybersecurity in the ANAO and cybersecurity auditing by the ANAO. Um, like many organisations, uh, we've suffered areas of non-compliance in our cybersecurity. Those are all remediated now and we found the audit useful for that. We don't ever audit ourselves. <laughs> And you'd think that with all the auditors in our building, we would audit ourselves, we don't. Uh, we use external audit um, uh, for good reason. Um, the other thing was that the, uh, the auditor uh, recommended we do more cyber auditing, and that's a matter that the Auditor General will consider in the building of the, the new um, audit work program. I think from the Joint Committee's perspective, um, there's been an inquiry already this year into cyber auditing. You've seen a lot of action from PM&C around the cyber strategy, etc. And it's an area that the Parliament's very concerned about. Strong recommendations from the Joint Committee. And that sense of priority from the Parliament will be considered by the, the Auditor General. Um, You've probably come across some of the new faces in the ANAO. We've had some change. Um, Ian Goodwin, who was formerly the head of Assurance Audit, is now the Deputy Auditor General in New South Wales, and so Carla Yago um, is now the head of Assurance Audit. Um, Lisa Rauter has joined us from uh, DFAT um, with uh, background in AusAid, DHS and Finance to be the Practice Manager for Performance Auditing. Um, We've had a lot of uh, change in executive directors in assurance auditing. Uh, new faces include Jody George, Lisa Craswell, and Bola Oyutunji, who's joining us from the New South Wales Audit Office. Um, we've got new faces in performance audit as well. Sally Ramsey and Michelle Page uh, have, have become executive directors. Uh, and we also have um, several of our key executives on secondment into other agencies. So John Jones has been at the Department of Communications. He's rejoining us in January. Brandon Jarrett is pretty much halfway through a two-year secondment to Prime Minister and Cabinet. And Mark Simpson has just started a secondment to um, Agriculture. Now, I'm not offering you all an executive <laughs> from the ANAO, but one of the things that I've been really keen to do is refresh a lot of our senior people in understanding how things operate in your worlds, including our ELs, EL1s and EL2s. 
Um, and, uh, and when they come back, you can be sure they don't audit the agency that they've been in. But if you did feel in your risk or your uh, accounting areas that you were looking for um, some different faces, have a talk to us because we have a lot of really talented people um, whose skills can be refreshed by joining your agencies. Um, another new leadership focus area for us is systems audit and data analytics. Um, you'd be aware that around the world uh, accounting firms and, and audit offices and probably your own agencies are trying to leverage data analytics uh, for a variety of reasons. So are we. And Jocelyn Ashford is now the Senior Executive Director of um, Systems Audit and Data Analytics and she'll touch uh, just on a few of our challenges and, and opportunities in there. Uh, we're out in the market uh, for IT at the moment um, and we're also out in the market for accommodation. So I share some of, uh, I know many of you in your CFO roles also run business services and all of those things in your agencies, I share your pain. Um, as I, a little plug again for our website, um, we've made the uh, website very, very user friendly. Around the world in the Supreme Audit Institutes it's considered the best. Um, it's worth just subscribing to your own portfolio if you haven't already or a portfolio that's like yours that we might be auditing in to see what we're doing and see what learnings you can get from that. And in that, Lisa will talk to you today about the, uh, how we're trying to build learnings from audits into insights. There you go, it's not you, Jane. Um, and um, share those learnings and how you can get your hands on those. Lastly, I just wanted to talk to you about some observations about engagements with entities. First of all, um, with the new secretary's round announced in September, you should be aware that the Auditor General, um, both at changes of government, changes of ministry and changes of secretary, writes to all um, new people in new roles and, and gives a rundown. Um, so if you're in one of those departments, you may have seen that letter. It, it goes into financial and performance issues. Um, in financial auditing, engagement remains strong. Um, on the whole, we're seeing uh, good quality in the development of financial statements across the sector. Um, I say that recognising that your work is externally assured, um, and so I'm sure that's an incentive to do well. Um, survey results are due back this week uh, from your entities about our assurance auditing work. It's a bit different in performance auditing, I suspect, um, largely because those uh, daily, on the go, all the time relationships are not there. Um, very few entities, um, probably four or five, have performance auditors in them all the time. Um, one area that we're starting to observe and probably will uh, do some thinking in the new year about um, where do our powers fit into this, um, what more can we do, is the pace at which entities are providing with us with access to data and information in, in their agencies. Um, we probably need to do more with your executives about our powers. It's not, um, it is mandatory, <laughs> unfortunately for you. Um, uh, we have people who say you can't have that, you can't have it electronically, I'll get it to you when I can. Um, I get a lot of deputy secretaries visiting me saying oh, it's a, the audit is a burden and the, the audit is authorised by the parliament. Um, yes, it's a burden and the faster we can get in and get out, the less burdensome it is for people. Um, so getting people access to IT systems within the first week is imperative because our people can search, hunt and get out. Um, or they can sit in your entity for weeks and weeks and weeks and really annoy you. <laughs> so um, a message I wouldn't mind you taking back to your entities is, um, particularly if you can talk with your IT people, the faster we can get in now. One of the other parts of obser observing that is how poor record keeping is across the sector. Um, as a result of that, we will come in and take terabytes and terabytes of your email data. Um, we have no choice because your staff are generally not using their trims and their EDRMSs, etc. And email is becoming the default record keeping in many agencies. We have the power to do it and we have the capacity and capability to do it. We use software to search for us, um, both uh, in all the different components of an email and in free text. And 
uh, we're not really interested in who's making a, an appointment for the dog groomer. Uh, people are worried about their personal emails. We'll delete them. Um, as soon as you leave them on the system, they're a business record. We're not interested in them. We're interested in the default record. Um, so Jocelyn uh, will talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, in the performance auditing, interestingly, um, we don't talk to the media, we don't brief the media, we don't brief the media before a report goes out, we don't comment in the media about a report that's gone out. We see our audience as the parliament. Um, and uh, we've heard around the traps that um, we're a really negative audit office. Um, no. It's a quick statistic. Of the last 20 reports tabled, um, 10 of them were positive you know, that the administration of this was effective or the way this was done was effective. Five were negative and five were neutral. Funnily enough, the gallery at Parliament House is really only interested in the negative. Um, when we did this sort of analysis last year, it was about 30, 30, 30. And it can be affected by being requested by Parliament to do a particular order and agreeing to do it. Um, we're really conscious of making sure that we call it as we see it on the evidence. So that evidence gathering becomes quite important to us. Well, it just is. Lastly, I, I just make a, an observation about some of the public commentary about the ANAO. Uh, we've seen this in the parliament, we've seen it in the media, we hear it in your agencies about us being down in the weeds. Um, that's an interesting commentary from our perspective. We've certainly seen it in some of the PGPA submissions as well. Um, you know, because of how you operate under accounting standards, and we operate under accounting and audit standards. And when we do performance auditing, we audit against frameworks. We kind of just don't make it up. We look for the rule setting framework that's driving the performance in this area. Some of those are set by parliament, some set by government, so you know, policies like the fraud policy, the PSPF, etc. Many of them are set by your agency's own accountable authorities, and interestingly, many of them are very detailed. That's the weeds we audit against. Um, we are thinking about a new category of audits. We won't call it weeds audits, um, but to be quite clear that we're auditing in a particular way at a particular time under certain standards. Um, one of the interesting things that we do note, and if you, um, if you had like six minutes now that you finished your financial statements and you're getting ready for um, mid-year reviews, etc., um, is the notion that we see compliance with your own rules as an indication of culture. Um, this is something that we've spoken about in the parliament and interestingly, Alistair McGibbon, um, the, the cyber head for government, is talking about uh, compliance being an indication of culture. Um, the Parliament has a, a real view about culture, and if it sees non-compliance, it starts to worry. So do we. Um, if I I'll just wrap up and uh, move on to our first um, technical speaker. <laughs> um, one of the things that we try to do through the year is that we obviously attend all of your audit committees. Um, uh, we do look for opportunities to come and speak to uh, your SES meetings, uh, whether they be at whole of agency or within groups. If you think it's useful for us to touch base with your SES, particularly if you've got, um, you know, looking forward at the program, the likelihood of audits coming up, uh, just get in touch with our external relations area. You can do that by email um, or just call our switch and you'll get through, put through to somebody who can help us organise um, getting you uh, an external speaker. Uh, from the ANAO uh, to talk about uh, some of our work and what it means, including insights and good learning. Without further ado then, um, thanks again for coming. Thanks to those of you who are engaging with us through live streaming. Um, ask Serena Buchanan uh, to come and speak to you about key themes that have emerged from this year's audit season. Thanks.
So good morning, everyone. Um, as Serena just mentioned, my name is Serena Buchanan, and I'm the Senior Executive Director of Quality in the um, Assurance Services Group. So uh, I'm just going to touch on a bit of an overview of what's going to be in our end of year report that we're expecting to table just before the December shutdown, and then just also touch on um, some of the client, the survey responses, and what we've done uh, to address some of the comments in it. But they're the results from 15, 16. Rona mentioned the current surveys out with you all at the moment, and I think we're, I think it closes at the end of this week. So the end of year reports the uh, second report that Assurance Services Group. Uh, tables in Parliament each year. Rona mentioned the controls report, which covers about 25 of our major um, general government sector and uh, GBEs. And then this is the report that covers the results of all the financial statement audits we've done in 16-17. So we had... um, 239 entities this year, and at the end of November, 234 of those audits had been finalised. Um, Our timeliness of reporting, so we had 87% of our auditors' reports issued within three months of year end, which was um, an improvement on last year that was about 80% of our auditors' reports tabled within three months. Um, This year we've also, Raina mentioned, we've got a piece included in the report that has a look at the timing of our auditors' reports and the financial statements and when annual reports were tabled in Parliament. Um, So of the 239 financial statement audits we do, uh, 178 of those entities are required to table an annual report in Parliament. And of those, um, we provided 54 or around 30% of our auditors' reports within two months of year end, and 91% or 162 auditors' reports within three months. Now, comparing that to the tabling of annual reports, um, there were two entities that had tabled their annual report within three months of year end, and another 149 that had tabled within four months of year end, and then the balance Um, I think there's a couple that haven't tabled to date. So the report covers the period up to the 30th of November. Uh, We've also got in the report this year a piece on um, the financial sustainability of the material entities, which we've been doing for a number of years now. Um, We've developed some parameters around commonly accepted um, indicators of financial sustainability on both operating results and um, balance sheets, and it's on the departmental side of our material entities' financial statements. And the results this year are similar to um, last year's results. And um, I guess goes, being government entities, the going concern concept and financial sustainability is a little bit different to what it is in the private sector. But we do look at what causes potentially timing differences and impacts on the bottom line of agencies. Uh, We've also um, followed up in both our interim report this year and the end of year report last year, we've had some short pieces on the changes to executive remuneration reporting and how that's going. Um, You'd all be aware of the letter from the uh, Secretary of PM&C that came out during the year to portfolio secretaries requesting information regarding executive remuneration and highly um, paid staff remuneration to be published on websites. So we didn't, um, we haven't undertaken audit procedures on the data that was published, but what we did have a look at were um, what entities had reported and what timing they'd reported by. So um, I think out of all of the entities, the request covered 158 entities, um, the the subsidiaries and and some of the other entities that fall outside the sector weren't included in the request. So when we had a little look on um, the websites, there were um, 25 entities that didn't publish the information. Again, the analysis was done up to the end of November. Um, We followed up with those entities and there were a number of reasons as to why um, they hadn't published the information. Some hadn't been aware of the request, some um, they they had privacy considerations of the data. Uh, There was a view that that the current reporting within the financial statements was adequate. Um, The REM tribunal may have covered those particular executives, so they decided that that was sufficient remuneration information and they didn't need to separately provide anything else. And then two two of those entities are intending to publish, but they're publishing it as part of their annual report. 
Uh, and then the piece also just um, makes the observation that of the entities that did publish the information, there were 65 that uh, did it subsequent to the requested time frame of 31 July. And then I'm just before turning over to some of the survey results from our entity survey, touch on the findings in the report. So it's, it is fairly consistent with last year. Uh, there has been a reduction in the moderate or category B audit findings. Um, we have made a bit of an adjustment in our analysis because last year the entities associated with the Norfolk Hospital and Norfolk Administration were part of our mandate to audit, but they weren't part of it in 16-17. So if we take the findings associated with um, those away, um, we're down from uh, mid-20s to about 20 category B findings. Um, I think one of, probably for me, um, what was quite pleasing to see, last year there were a number of A and B findings that had been unresolved from private, previous periods. Um, this year there's only one finding, one significant finding that relates to last year. Anything else has been resolved or downgraded by entities and the findings that we're reporting this year are new ones identified this year. Um, the Category C findings are still a similar number, are sitting at around 200. So certainly um, a category to keep an eye on. Uh, the focus tends to be on significant and moderate findings, but those C findings um, that are outstanding for a period of time and, not, and don't get addressed have the potential to be upgraded in category. Um, again, similar to last year, the two key areas that the significant and moderate audit findings relate to, so I think it's, it's around about the 75 plus percent of, our, of those findings, are in um, IT security, so with, associated with user access, monitoring of privileged users, um, and in the quality assurance frameworks that support either compliance programs or financial statement reporting. Um, they were the main things I wanted to cover on um, what we're putting in the end of your report. I'm happy if anyone's got any questions on any of it. No? All right, I'll just move on to the next slide, which is just a little bit of our survey. So as we mentioned, this is um, the results of the survey of last year. So we had 144 um, respondents. Um, we uh, exceeded our target or achieved the target about the, the value added by our services is acknowledged by you all and um, as is the professional skills and the organisational understanding of the ANAO staff on your audits. Um, we did uh, in the area of um, timeliness of delivery of the audit program, uh, continuity of our audit staff and um, improvement in knowledge of your entities by the staff engaged on the job. While we met our target in those areas, it was a decrease of acknowledgement from the year before and um, I think reflects what have, we've had a lot of resourcing challenges in the last 12 to 24 months. Um, it is a bit of a, a challenge in the auditing sector for recruiting and retaining staff and something that we've been focusing on. Um, so what we're looking to do, um, we've implemented a new resourcing tool and we're looking at some different options to approach our recruitment and um, revise our strategy there and look at, Rona had mentioned about secondments and things like that. So look at how we can support our workforce in that area. So through the 17-18 audit, um, hopefully we'll be able to focus on that and um, get some improvement there. Um, the last part was, so we also in last year's survey asked a couple of questions on the CFO forum. So the year before, um, I can't remember the venue we had it in, it might have been Ridges, but got some very clear feedback on the venue uh, and also on the challenges that are faced by a number of CFOs in attending in person. So um, last year we had it at National Press Club and got better feedback on that and hopefully today's venue is acceptable. Certainly the morning tea looked quite tasty. And um, with the streaming today for those of you that couldn't be here in person, um, I hope that's well received. So that was about all I had. If there's no questions, I might hand over to Jane, who's going to touch on some other elements of the end of your report. Thank you. 
Thanks, Serena. So my name's Jane Mead. I'm the Group Executive Director in the Professional Services and Relationships Group at the ANAO. So I just wanted to talk about a couple of aspects um, around the auditing standard space, I guess, and, and the technical space. Firstly, though, um, Rona mentioned in her opening remarks um, that the ANAO um, attended a JCPAA hearing to discuss our 2015-16 end of year report during the year. So this um, hearing was part of an inquiry of by the JCPAA into Commonwealth financial statements. I just wanted to, I guess, as a, a bit of an opening to the, you know, the audit space, talk about the, the role of financial statement audits from the point of view of the JCPAA. So some comments that they made in their report, which they issued in August about financial statement audits, was that these audits play a critical role in ensuring accountability to the parliament and the Australian public for the expenditure of public funds and also that they provide independent assurance that this information is accurate and that the financial management of Commonwealth entities is effective. So as Rona mentioned, I mean, that, you know, sort of, I guess, showed the importance of the work that we do in the financial audit space um, from the Parliament's point of view, as well as in the performance audit space. So moving on to some auditing matters, the first thing I wanted to talk about was key audit matters. So this is um, a new standard that applied and we applied in our 2016-17 financial statement audits um, to selected audits within our portfolio. So the new auditing standard basically talks about key audit matters as matters that in the auditor's professional judgment were of the most significance in the audit of the financial statements in the current year. So what it's requiring is for the auditor in their audit report to make some comment about the areas that were most significant to their audit. Those matters that get reported by the auditor, and this is shown in the diagram that was on the slide before, sorry, Karen, um, are selected from the matters that are communicated to those charged with governance. So you can see the largest circle there is all the matters that we're required to communicate with those charged with governance under the standard. There's one particular standard that deals with that, plus another, a number of other standards throughout the framework. That then gets da brought down a little bit to significant audit matters. So we say of all those matters we discussed with those charged with governance, which ones were significant to the audit? And that's a matter of professional judgment of the auditor. Out of those matters, which were the most significant? So let's bring it down to the really, really key few matters that we believe were most significant to our audit. And they're the ones that we describe in the audit report in the new section on key audit matters. So in determining, determining when, um, which matters are actually the ones that are the most significant to the audit, some of the things that we take into our account are areas that we've assessed as having a high risk of material misstatement or significant risks. So I should be aware from the audit strategy documents that we put out, we make that assessment at, at the beginning of the audit. We'll then think about any significant auditor judgments that we've made during the audit. And normally they're going to re relate to areas of significant judgment for management and the entity as well. So you're talking a lot about um, areas that have a high amount of estimation uncertainty, significant estimates where you need to use models and the like. And in a moment we'll talk about the areas where we had um, the, our main key audit matters and, and you'll see that that, that is, is the main area of focus. And we also consider the effect on our audit of significant events and transactions that have occurred during the year. So taking those things into account and, and um, applying them, we break down to the areas that we believe that we should report on as key audit matters. So as I said, this is a, a new auditing standard that, that came into effect that um, was applied um, to December 16 and June 17 audits um, throughout basically internationally. When this standard came into effect in Australia, it was made mandatory only for audits of listed entities, but it was available to all auditors to voluntarily adopt um, as they, they saw fit. So we considered whether 
the Auditor General considered whether it would be appropriate to apply this standard. And in 2015-16, we did have a limited trial of the standard with some a number of entities. What we did there was we produced an audit report that would look like that would include key audit matters that we, if we had been implementing the standard that we would have included in the audit report. We didn't publish those audit reports. They were for internal discussions with management um, and the audit committee. So some of you may have seen those audit reports. We then did a, a post-implementation review of that um, and the Auditor General decided that he would like to voluntarily adopt CAM reporting for 25 entities. So for our major entities that are included in the controls report, each year and that they were this year then published in audit reports to the Minister. So in making that determination, the Auditor General considered that CAM reporting um, was better practice in the financial statements auditing profession and probably more importantly it was consistent with the ANAO's outcome of improving public sector performance and accountability through independent reporting to the parliament, the executive and the public. So that was the reason that we, we voluntarily adopted the standard. So the purpose of including key audit matters in the audit report is to increase transparency about the audit performed. So as I said before, it's where did the auditor make significant judgments during the audit? Where was there robust discussion with the entity? And um, I guess in that way, we're putting some transparency to users of the reports, and in our case, that's predominantly the, the parliament and, and also the public, um, as to areas that are, are important to the audit and therefore important for their understanding of the financial statements. The other purpose of CAM is also to increase communications between the auditor and the auditee. Um, and what has been found um, over this being applied in other jurisdictions in the past and people are starting to see in Australia is that it actually improves disclosures in the financial statements because if a matter is going to be referred to in the audit report as a key audit matter, it will normally refer to disclosures in the financial statements and therefore entities will be more inclined to make more robust disclosure about matters that we're going to report on. So it, it does have that impact as well. It's important to note that the CAM that we disclose in our audit reports, those key audit matters, don't provide a separate conclusion on that matter. So remembering that the audit opinion is given on the financial statements as a whole, we're not concluding on those individual matters that they're fairly stated, etc. Nor do we imply in the key audit matters that the matter that we're discussing has been resolved. So it may be the case that something we're discussing is a, a finding um, that would be also presented in our end of year report and it may be an open finding. So just to keep that in mind. So just wanted to run you briefly through what we found in our, <coughs> excuse me, CAM reporting this year. The majority of the key audit matters that we reported did relate to valuation. So of the 25 entities that we reported um, key audit matters on, as I said, they were the entities that are included, the controls entities that are included in our controls report of major entities. We had a total of 57 key audit matters in audit reports. And the number of CAM in each entity ranged from one to four. So every entity that we reported CAM on had at least one key audit matter in the audit report. I've listed the top five there, and as I said, most of them were around valuation, which makes sense because if you're doing a, a fairly complex valuation, there is a high level of estimation uncertainty, therefore a high level of judgment um, adopted by yourselves and, and the entity in determining what that valuation is. And then <clears throat> likewise, accordingly, the auditor has to apply a lot of professional judgment in auditing those numbers. So the, the top one was valuation of liabilities. The types of liabilities there were financial liabilities, provisions and superannuation liabilities. Valuation of financial assets, a lot of that was around investments, so financial assets and also loans. Valuation of non-financial assets, so property, plant and equipment makes sense in the public sector where um, the property, plant and equipment is not necessarily straightforward in terms of being able to obtain a valuation and also intangibles. Completeness and accuracy of revenue was, was quite um, high on the list. 
um, and, I th and a, a number of entities had key audit matters in respect of that, and then accounting for personal benefits as well. So they were the, the top five for us, which is, is quite an interesting list. In the, I thought I'd just do a little bit of a comparison with private sector experience. So in the private sector, as I said, um, I think you would find that this has been adopted primarily for listed entities. I don't think there would be a lot of instances where auditors have vol voluntarily adopted the standard outside the listed entity space. KPMG um, regularly issue a publication that talk about the top five key audit matters that they've got, and I just thought it was an interesting comparison um, with the private sector. So their key areas are, are goodwill, revenue, likewise, um, similar to the public sector taxation, acquisitions and inventory, so quite, quite a different top five, which, which shows where the, the level of estimation can be quite different in the sectors. In terms of public sector adoption, Tasmania, Queensland and WA adopted CAM reporting in individual entities and did that live and published those key audit matter audit reports. Victoria only adopted for key audit matters for the equivalent of the, um, our CFS, the Consolidated Financial Statements Whole of Government. Um, the two key audit matters that they had in their whole of government accounts related to valuation of defined benefit superannuation liability, so similar to where we had some key audit matters there, and valuation for provision of insurance claims. So the last thing I just wanted to say in relation to CAM, and um, hopefully people that have been involved in this would, would agree with this statement, for the ANAO, um, the key important area for us in reporting these is early and continuous communication and that's critical to this process. So we communicate in our audit strategy documents at the time of planning what we expect will be key audit matters in the forthcoming year. That will be based on our experience, based on our assessment of significant risk. Clearly that can change as we go through the audit and new matters arise. And then we communicate throughout the audit as those matters arise. The last thing I wanted to talk about in the auditing standard space is um, more in the, in the area of performance statement auditing. So as you're probably aware, the Auditor General's Act requires the Auditor General to set what's called the ANAO auditing standards, and they're the standards that we apply and comply with when we perform our audits, both in the financial audit and the performance audit space. We also apply them, as Rona mentioned earlier, when we do assurance reviews and also to audits by arrangement. So currently the ANAO standards reference the Australian Auditing Standards Board standards um, completely. And um, so I just wanted to mention a couple of new standards that have come out in the performance auditing space, and that's ASA 3100 on compliance engagements and 3500 on performance engagements. So these two standards are Australian only standards. They don't have an international equivalent, as is the case with, with most other auditing standards um, in the auditing standards framework. They, there were previous auditing standards that the AUASB had issued in the past. These are revisions to those standards. So the reason for the revision was to bring them up to date under the framework of ASAE 3000, which is the standard that sits over the top of all the standards that auditors apply pretty much to um, not historical financial information. So when we do assurances and review, sorry, assurance, audits and reviews of information that isn't historical financial information. So what they did was basically revise these standards to, to fit under that framework. And both the standards have fairly similar requirements. So in terms of these standards and the one we predominantly apply is 3500 for our performance audits, the, the key, I guess, changes from our point of view that we need to consider are the minimum content requirements that have been introduced for performance audit reports, and that would be the same with compliance audits. They always had minimum content requirements. They've been extended, include um, a lot of items now that weren't there before. And these items are not currently included in our performance audit report. So it's the things that you see in a financial statement audit report where we talk about auditors' responsibilities, management responsibilities, um, compliance with ethical requirements and a lot. A lot of statements that, that talk about the framework, but we don't currently include in a performance audit report because that's not sort of central to what we're trying to communicate in that report. So while they, they could be included, they are, it is possible that we could 
um, determine that it's appropriate to include them in the reports going forward, it's not really consistent with the, the reporting approach of audit officers and supreme audit institutions. Um, so what we're doing as part of um, determining the Auditor General's standards um, from 1st of January, um, following the implementation of these standards, is just considering um, what would be the appropriate adoption um, of those standards going forward um, to determine what um, what our, our sorry what our ANAO standards will, will state. So we there are other frameworks for auditing globally. Um, Intersci, which is the international. Um, organisation of Supreme Audit Institutions, so it's a global group of Auditors General, if you like, um, have some standards. Our current performance audit standards would comply with the requirement that they put out. Um, so our approach in putting together our audit standards is to review the minimum content requirements um, and, and determine how we go forward. Our position is that we don't want to be asserting compliance with um, a standard if we don't comply with all the requirements, um, because that wouldn't be appropriate for us to do. So we're just considering how we'll apply that. Did anyone have any questions on any of those matters? Off the hook? Great. All right, um, I'll hand over now to Jocelyn Ashford. Jocelyn is the, as Rona mentioned, the Senior Executive Director in our new Systems Assurance and Data Analytics Group, which is a, even more of a mouthful than my group, I think. Um, and Jocelyn's going to talk to us both about consolidated financial statements and data analytics. Thank you. Good morning all. Um, I'm wearing two hats. Uh, one is my 1718 role, which is the executive responsible for the delivery of the consolidated financial statements. And then my second hat, which I'll talk to you about data analytics, is um, my role heading up the systems assurance and data analytics group. So first of all, I thought I'd touch on CFS. So as you are aware and have been impacted, this has been a big year for whole of government and in particular with the implementation of the uh, CBMSR system. So there's been a lot of change that has occurred and the financial statements that were produced have actually been produced effectively out of a new system, which is a big, which is a big uh, success from our, our viewpoint. Um, what we've also seen um, at the CFS level is a consolidation of quality assurance processes. So we've seen um, finance not only implement a new system, but undertake um, or also engage a, a quality assurance reviewer and also undertake a series of quality assurance activities over the supplementary reporting pack. We're actually quite supportive of the, we're actually supportive of the supplementary reporting pack. Um, as you're aware, it was implemented for a number of reasons. Um, and the main thing that it was uh, really, um, the purpose of it was to consolidate uh, for the whole of government accounts and to pick up those things that make consolidated uh, set of accounts different from the individual financial statements. So, so where you have different accounting policies, then the whole of government needs to collect additional information through the supplementary reporting pack to be able to uh, translate that into new accounting policies or accounting policies for CFS. So the other key thing uh, that we've been incredibly um, supportive of is the introduction of the reduced disclosure regime. So again, that drives a little bit more um, need for information from you in regards to what you need to include in the SRP um, and it makes our life easier in terms of supporting you with reduced disclosure in your own entity financial statements. Overall, the SRP is successful. What we have noted this year is an increased focus on the information included in the pack. And in fact, there's only really been one or two minor issues that we've noted that we need your support moving forward to address. And I've put an example there, which is basically around long service leave. And what we would like entities to do is to focus on um, some of the information included that is not in your financial reports, but included in the SRP, and in particular around your maturity or ageing of debtors or long service leave. What we noted across all 239 entities was a huge variation 
between current and non-current. Now, while you don't need that for your entity financial statements, whole of government does. So what we would ask entities to focus on is just QAing that SRP, thinking about whole of government, not necessarily just your financial statements, and really apply um, uh, a few more quality assurance processes around that information, the systems that support that information, and what gets reported in CFS. Okay, our 2018 audit expectations. Okay, so as you can see up there, we're not expecting significant changes to SRP. We think the process is working well. We think that finance has identified the right information that needs to be collected. And we believe that the quality assurance processes that they have in place now actually support um, an appropriate set of financial statements and a quality set of financial statements at whole of government. There is one change, as you may or may not be aware. The GFS manual is changing this year and will be adopted for the whole of government accounts. That will change some accounting treatment at the CFS level, so not at the entity level. So you may or may not be, depending on your entity, required to provide additional information to support the consolidation process. Um, and as I said, um, what we would like to see is some tighter QA processes around the SRP information, particularly around ageing or um, a related parties would be another example. But if you can actually look at your processes and think about what else you can add to that quality assurance role, we would appreciate that. Now putting on my second hat, which is a little bit more exciting. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say a little bit more exciting than whole of government accounts. Um, right, um, so what are the drivers of change? You are aware that of the digitisation of government agenda, and what we have seen is that agencies are changing service delivery, are collecting data and are sharing data very differently. You're changing your service models, and as Rona even indicated, even some of your processes are changing. For example, decision-making is being captured in emails, not in core systems. So the nature of your business is changing and we need to respond. Okay. Um, as Rona also mentioned, this is not new to the audit profession or the accounting firms and auditing firms have been on a transformation journey for the last three years about using data and using different service delivery models to increase quality and efficiency, and so have all the international audit organisations as well. So this is our new world, and it's going to keep, continue to change. So looking forward, agencies we see are using more federated data models. We're moving from the collect and hold into more of the connect and collect model, and so we need to respond to that change in the sector as well. Now, at the ANAO, what are we doing? Well, my role's been created, and that role is to look at how should we use, as in collect data, connect data for more information for our audit work. It is all about increasing audit quality, and is about, therefore, ensuring that we meet the standards, but it's also about efficiency as well. So Rona did talk about having access to data is really important. The faster we get access to data, the more we can use it and make the audit process more efficient. We will continue to use large-scale data. So at the moment, again, as Rona mentioned, we strip whole email systems. We pull entire inventory systems. Okay, we already collect a significant amount of data. And we will continue to do that for both the performance audit products and the financial statement audit products that we deliver. But beyond that, we'll be looking at large-scale data again for the other products such as our information reports and other assurance reports. We are continuing to increase our collaboration. So one of the principles that we're looking at is reuse of data that we already collect. So in the financial statement audit, where we collect data on an annual basis, some of, some of the data that we have for some of your entities is that we've got 12 years of inventory data. So we have a lot of knowledge and data in the system that we can actually utilise in our analytics to make the audit process more efficient and to increase the level of quality. So the key thing that we're looking at is 
increased collaboration between our business units, using the data we already collect and seeing where we can reuse it and where we can actually increase the efficiency of the audit process. Right, so what does that mean? What's our focus areas? We will be looking at publicly available data sets. How does that actually improve our risk assessment processes? How does that actually contribute to our themes that we'll be auditing? So this is a particular focus area on public, semi-public, but also using the data that we already collect from you, the entities. We also, again, as I said, the collaboration model is that we're looking to increase the use and reuse of data and making sure that all the audit products that we produce utilise the data in the best possible way and use that information um, to meet our mandate again for Parliament. It's primarily for the purposes of risk assessment and planning that we're using the data and to actually support targeted testing. So this is data that we've always collected and will continue to collect for our role. And I suppose I'm just trying to highlight to you that it is within the auditing standards. That's what we're actually focused on. It is not, um, as some people are a little bit nervous about, trolling or just searching for things. It has specific, we collect data for specific purposes. Okay. And it is all about audit quality. So we're trying to increase the level of audit quality and the efficiency of the audit in what we're doing. So what have we done about it? Uh, we're actually continuing to expand our data awareness within our teams. So we're looking at the capability within our teams, enabling our teams to be able to extract the data. We're aware that in agencies um, that it's sometimes a challenge to be able to provide us the information. Uh, so we're trying to upskill our workforce to be able to do that work. Okay. We're looking at a greater use of existing tools. As Rona said, we have the tools already, but we're looking at whether they're the most efficient way, the efficient tools that could be used. And we're also looking at whether uh, where the expectation, um, or the drivers of expectation in terms of how to present the information in a more effective way. So we're looking at different tools around that as well. Um, and we're also looking at uh, developing a two-year roadmap. Um, for those of you that have uh, worked closely with the firms or other data scientists or data organisations, you'll be aware that it is a, a very long process to establish capability processes um, across the board. And so we're looking at a two-year roadmap. So what are our challenges? So. Rona had mentioned um, access to data. You don't want the auditors sitting around your office for five, six, seven weeks. The faster we get access to the data, bearing in mind that we're only collecting the data for audit's purposes, is really important. We're aware that sometimes your skill sets of your staff don't allow you to extract because the systems have been built not to support the extract. We want to work closer with you and build some protocols and standards to allow us to extract that data in an easier manner. We're aware that you're working on models at the moment around federated data, which is the collect and connect model. Again, we need to work with you and that's a challenge because as you're developing those models, we need to respond to how you're collecting, collecting data. So that's going to be a challenge moving forward. And obviously one of our other challenges, investment in IT infrastructure to support the increasing use of data and data analytics. I think that was the last part of the challenges with it. Does anyone have any questions in regards to either the CFS consolidation process or data analytics? Rona? <laughs> I'm just going to thank Jocelyn for that and that data analytics space is something that will keep you up to date on uh, through change. One of the big differences that you'll see between an audit office moving this way and the private sector moving that way is that the private sector is moving that way to derive more income from you. Um, so they'll offer a bunch of analytical services on top of their normal management consulting offer, etc. We're not trying to create a new business line, we're trying to enhance the business that we do.
the next speaker is Michael White, our Executive Director, uh, who, in addition to doing performance statement audits, is also a financial auditor. And this is something you'll see more in the ANAO as we challenge our teams to work across different kinds of audits. This is becoming more common where we have um, staff involved in both financial statements audits and in performance audits. And in this case, a team, a blended team of financial and performance auditors working together and developing um, a methodology and an approach to auditing performance statements. So welcome, Michael. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Rona, for that introduction. Um, as Rona said, um, I'm responsible for the work that we're currently doing in the ANAO on auditing the implementation of performance statements across the Commonwealth. This is one of a trilogy of audits we're doing following the introduction of the PGPA Act. Uh, the other two are the corporate plans performance audits, which I think we've, we've already done two and we've commenced our third. And our risk management work where we've done one audit that's been tabled and we're starting uh, the second now. <clears throat> In terms of performance statements, we've done one, one audit already, uh, which I'm going to talk briefly about this morning. Uh, and we've started a second one and I'll talk about the way going forward uh, a little later on. Firstly, I should acknowledge that we undertook this audit work in a different method to what we would normally do within the ANAO. We selected entities for our first work where we thought that from the availability of public information, we could assess quality entities and where we would be able to find good lessons for the rest of the Commonwealth to assist in the implementation of the PGPA Act. We selected uh, the two entities, uh, the AFP and Agriculture, um, based on our knowledge of the entities, our experience with them in the past, and the ability for them to provide us quality data sets uh, because we know what they publish um, publicly every year, both through the, the PBS, the corporate plans, and their annual reports. The criteria we set ourselves was fairly straightforward. Uh, and as you would imagine, the first thing that we were looking for was whether or not entities complied with the PGP Act. Did they publish uh, the appropriate information uh, by the time they were required to? <clears throat> as I said, we were looking at entities where we'd already been able to assess the publicly available information. So the response to the next question was pretty straightforward. Did the entities have appropriate supporting frameworks in place uh, to provide uh, performance statements and provide assurance over them. We're also looking to understand whether or not the selection of information that entities provided was appropriate. And you can see there we've defined that or followed the lead from the Department of Finance to say that is the information relevant, reliable and complete. We've been using that definition for some years and it's working reasonably well. We're also looking to see whether entities in a similar vein to financial statements were able to publish information that was complete and accurate. Were there sufficient records behind it for it to be appropriately audited by the ANAO so that we could publish our results to the parliament? Obviously, in terms of compliance, we would have expected that every entity in the Commonwealth would comply with the requirements of the PGP Act and the rule. And obviously we found that the entities here did that. In terms of the scope of the rest of the work that we looked at, being our first work of auditing the implementation of the performance statements, we had to downscope or downsize the amount of work that we were looking at. Uh, entities vary enormously across the Commonwealth, as you would know. Some entities have huge programs and large numbers of them. Some entities are very small and only have a single program. So what we attempted to do was look at the performance criteria for a single program within the entities and look at all of the performance criteria for that program. <clears throat> what we were looking to find was whether or not an entity could provide performance criteria 
in a well-rounded manner that would demonstrate an understanding and accurate reporting of the performance of the program that we were looking at. Going forward, we will need to be able to audit all programs and all performance criteria within an entity. But as Rona mentioned a little earlier, there's nearly 700 performance criteria just within the general government sector within the Commonwealth. Probably amounts to some thousands of performance criteria across the Commonwealth if all entities were included. <clears throat> That's a program of a lot of work for the ANAO were we to do that. And one thing to keep in mind is that the finance minister or responsible minister can ask us to undertake an audit of an entity's performance statements at any time. We need to prepare the ANO to be in place to provide a response to any request from, as I said, either the minister or the finance minister. As part of this process, we also worked very closely with the Department of Finance. We looked at the role that the Department of Finance had played in um, supporting the introduction of the PGPA Act, including the guidance that's been issued, the RMGs, uh, the communities of practice, which I know finance hold fairly regularly and which at times uh, we attend, sometimes to speak and sometimes to, to observe and, and understand what finance are looking for from entities. I think um, the, the simple answer for us is that the finance guidance provides sufficient support for an entity to deliver throughout the corporate plan, risk management and performance statements arena. Over time, obviously, it will be enhanced, but I think at this point in time, there's nothing in the guidance or nothing in the framework which inhibits an entity from delivering appropriate performance information through its performance statements in its annual report. This has been a framework which has been in place for some decades within the Commonwealth with realistically very little change in the PGPA Act. The one key change in the PGPA Act, and something that we discussed earlier this year with the JCPAA, is that this framework provides greater flexibility for entities. It allows entities to not just focus on effectiveness KPIs, which the previous framework focused on, but also for entities to use efficiency measures, output measures, and I think in the first, the first time that we've seen, allows entities to use proxy measures, analysis and environmental information to actually explain the results that they've achieved. That's a key thing in this framework because it allows entities not to focus just on one target, on one piece of performance information, and whether or not you achieve that target. It allows you to provide information about how the entity's progressed, what the environmental influences were that actually impacted the entity during the program, the program's implementation. So the framework is an in principle framework and it is there to support all entities across the Commonwealth regardless of size. Some entities will need to distill what they need from that framework to keep things appropriate for themselves. Other entities will need to use all elements of the framework because of the diversity of their programs and the size and nature of the information that's available. Now, I should also note that uh, the independent review of the PGPA Act is currently underway and I think uh, there's been some mention already this morning of uh, the submissions uh, publicly available on Finance's website and which makes some fairly interesting reading. As I noted earlier, I think we expected all entities to comply with the introduction of the PGP Act and the rule in the area of performance statements, uh, equally risk management and corporate plans. What we also saw and is possibly debatable is whether or not entities took a ground up approach to developing and implementing the requirements under the PGP Act or whether they just took a bolt on approach looked for the minimum requirements and added it to what they already did. To some extent, because we selected entities that were already well versed in performance management and performance information, both AFP and agriculture had fairly deep programs running over performance information within their entities. I think we would have to say that other entities where um, we've been able to look at the 
uh, available public information, it's not as deep and it's fairly obvious fairly quickly that some entities took a bolt on approach. So there is an opportunity for a lot of entities to undertake a review of what they've done and look at whether or not the information and the work that they're doing for corporate plans and performance statements is really at a low level, at a granular level within their entity and something that their entity is actually honouring and following or whether it's a piece of administrative overhead. Because the idea is that entities should be able to benefit from appropriate performance management. Using the performance information, you should be able to make changes to your programs as you need to, whether they're falling behind or whether they're ahead of schedule. You should be able to manage resources, funding and staff to the <clears throat> appropriate areas where those resources are needed. And that's the key focus that this framework should be putting in people's minds. Management should be using the information regularly in the management of its business. In terms of AFP and agriculture, um, both entities did really well throughout the process. Uh, as I noted before, we were grateful of um, being able to select entities from publicly available information where there would be good outcomes from the audit. And we were also very grateful that both entities came to the table willingly to work with us. Uh, I would have to say we are stretched in, in some areas in terms of their abilities and skills and knowledge and some of that information will go back into our audit program going forward. We learnt some of the lessons uh, from the process as well as them. So entities, the two entities basically provided mostly relevant information, mostly reliable information, and it was mostly supported by sufficient documentation. In fact, I think it was probably seen as a, as a bit of a test run for both AFP and agriculture. By the time we'd finished the work, both entities had already implemented fixes to a number of the issues that, that came up during the process. Uh, we noted that in the report. Uh, we also didn't put any recommendations uh, to either entity from the work that we did in the report. Um, we were looking more for the lessons learned uh, that would come from it that could be applied more broadly across the Commonwealth. The key learnings which are reported in report number 58 uh, are published as we are doing within the ANAO with all of the performance audits. And I'll run through quickly some of the key points for people to, to look at, and this is all in the report um, for anyone who, who wants to have a look at it at a later point in time. One of the key issues that we found was that entities didn't reflect on who and how a benefit was going to be attributed to from the outcome of the program. The idea of a target population has been in place within the Commonwealth framework for a very long time, uh, at least decades. But entities still aren't looking clearly at who and how uh, the benefit of the program is supposed to be attributable to, and then following through on measuring that. Entities didn't disclose the basis for measurement of uh, the criteria that we were looking at very difficult if you don't know as a reader, and, and this, this information is for the parliament and the public, to understand how you're going to measure something helps give you an idea of your expectations and then judge once the program is completed whether or not a reasonable effort was made on behalf of the program. Targets were also something that was treated very differently across the Commonwealth. Uh, some entities didn't like to put targets in um, against their measures, which is quite strange because I, I doubt that any entity didn't have a target in mind itself. And in fact, entities are required to publish their targets within their PBS. So quite often that material was actually available publicly in another area, but not included within the performance statements. Entities, um, I think, mentioned earlier, often have a problem with record keeping and by and large um, the completeness and accuracy was good as I, as I mentioned earlier um, but we would have probably expected it to be better uh, even though it was a first time implementation. 
In terms of completeness within appropriateness, it's about whether or not there's a, a rounded collection of material that adequately explains the results of the program. It's very subjective, we understand that. It's not as straightforward or as simple as a lot of the metrics that CFOs will be generating for financial statements. But it's also a lot to do with common sense. The information has to be able to make sense. If it's relevant to the program you're working on, if it's reliable information, and there's sufficient information there for people to, to broadly understand how the program went, it's finished. It's not a difficult task uh, for most entities. And in fact, having worked with entities in program areas for a long time, most people that I've worked with can tell me these things off the top of their head. They know what they're doing, they know what they expect, and they know the kind of measures they're looking for. Some of that didn't translate into the work that we've looked at to date. <clears throat> One of the other things that I think we found, and this is an area where it's difficult, is entities had difficulty with attribution. There were some very good metrics available for entities. Entities were obviously involved to some extent within the programs, but they may have been shared outcomes. Or they may have actually been outcomes where environmental influences were dominant rather than activities of the government. Working through those more complex areas is where we'll be focusing going forward, but there are lots of opportunities for entities to get advice from either <clears throat> statisticians or academics or um, actuaries or other areas of professional expertise in this area if there's an issue with attribution. <clears throat> Overall, I think we were looking for balance. Does the program actually provide an understanding to a non-versed user of the material. And again, I think both entities in the program did this quite well. The key learnings, um, and I'll keep them fairly short, um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence of entities providing QA over the material that they're providing. There are some very obvious issues within the performance statement territory, um, and entities would, I think, benefit from groups like yourselves providing the same sorts of input or QA that you would provide or ask for someone else to provide over financial statements. Have a look and see whether there are anomalies in the information that's being provided. See whether the information makes sense, whether it's balanced, whether it focuses on one program or individually each program in a rounded way. Entities so far haven't been able to demonstrate that they even use checklists to test against the RMGs. It's a very, very simple process and yet from the financial statement background we would see it in every set of financial statements. We didn't see it happening within the performance statements. <clears throat> The Audit Committee's charter was also something that got some attention, although a very minor part of the audit from all the work that we'd done. It also resulted possibly in the most noise from the audit across the Commonwealth. Audit Committees must review the appropriateness of an accountable authority's performance reporting. The development of the PGPA Act and the rule went for many years. They've been in place for a couple of years now and we would have expected that audit committee charters where by and large they actually state that they have to be re reviewed every 12 months or two years anyway hadn't been updated since the introduction of the Act. In fact in the two entities that we worked with in this audit neither entity's audit committee could demonstrate that they'd reviewed the appropriateness of the performance statements. They may have looked at some of the information, they may have asked for an internal audit. What we're looking for is the documented review and sign off to an accountable authority that meets the requirements of the Act and the rule. And we will continue doing so through our next series of audits. Looking forward, as I, as I noted, we have already commenced the next audit of the implementation of the performance statements for 
We've included Environment, Employment, Austrade and the Australian Sports Commission. We're due to table that report in March 2018. In 2017-18, we are likely to commence another performance statements audit. Uh, obviously, the Auditor General will need to make a decision. We will likely commence around April and table around December. We are trying to bring back our timelines so that they align with entities' annual reporting processes, which would give us nine months to get to the 2019 September period for entities' annual reports if we were to do uh, an audit at the request of a Minister or Finance Minister or engage in a larger program uh, as directed by the Auditor General. At this stage, it would appear that we will focus on the larger entities in the Commonwealth, predominantly the Departments of State and other entities in our controls report. We do need to prepare, be prepared in case we get request of a minister, and I'd hazard a guess that probably the most likely time that we'd receive a request from a responsible minister would be post an election, if a minister was interested in the validity of the performance information provided by an entity they were going to inherit, uh, it would seem to me a reasonably simple step to request the ANAO to look at that material and provide an opinion on it. We'll continue to focus at the program level. We'll continue to work with the Department of Finance. Uh, obviously, the review of the PGPA Act at the moment may throw uh, additional questions into the mix of the Act and the rule. It may remove some. We're uncertain at this point in time. Um, but it is interesting to watch the progress in this space. Uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Um, I've already had a couple outside uh, over the morning tea stand. I'm more than happy to talk through anything that you've got on your mind. No? All right. Well, I'll hold hand over to Lisa Router, the head of our performance audit group. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm Lisa Router, the head of the Performance Audit Group, uh, just a relative newbie with the ANAO. Um, I'm going to take you through some of the key learnings that we've been extracting from our performance audit reports. Um, and we've been compiling them in a particular part of the summary for performance audits since about July this year, so it's a bit of a new process for us. Um, but audits are a really good opportunity for the ANAO to really look across government and see what trends um, and what's happening in terms of, of areas of really good performance and, and areas that could be improved. And we think it's important to be able to share those with you and important for you to take notice of, of where good, there's good practice happening and what does that look like and where there's areas where we could do better. Uh, and that learning and those trends uh, is, is what we capture in our performance audits. Um, so while each entity has their own context, their own policy frameworks, their own processes, there's lots of similarities across what we all do as well. Uh, and it's important to share what's being done well and what could be done better so that you can each learn from each other and reform your own policies and processes to, to reach that better practice. The ANAO, as you would be, be aware, no longer produces the better practice guides. Uh, and so these insights reports that we will use to capture and aggregate the key learnings will be published every quarter, uh, with our first one coming out around mid-December. Um, and they will help you get, share, I guess, those insights um, from each audit report in an aggregated way in that one sort of one-stop shop, uh, and a useful way to, for us to share what we consider to be good practice uh, with the broader government community and to give you an insight on what we're going to be looking for when we come and, and do performance audits in your organisation. Uh, the reason we're not doing the better practice guides, uh, for one, is we're not the policy and framework owners, uh, so it's really up to those owners to establish that better practice. Um, but what we can do is where those policies and practices are being implemented uh, to see whether the agency are doing it in accordance with the policies and, and guidelines, uh, whether the agency is setting their own performance expectations, uh, their risk appetites, uh, whether, they're, whether they're delivering on those, um, and what the agencies are learning and capturing their own learnings uh, about the practices uh, and what's going well. 
uh, and not. So when undertaking an audit, we capture the findings and recommendations for the specific entity or group of entities that we're auditing. But as we're going through that, we consider which of those learnings are going to be really relevant for the rest of government uh, and capture those in our lessons learned section. So you'll find it at the end of the summary section uh, of, of a performance audit. The lessons will be aggregated each quarter, um, and over that period we'll have about 12 performance audits on average to draw from, and we'll publish those insights on our website. So as Rona said, do subscribe to our website and you'll get a, um, an alert when we, when we publish. So if you subscribe um, as well, and yeah, look out for those insights when they come out. Next one. Um, so a good opportunity um, to see from a really single point of reference the themes that are emerging from our audits. A uh, good way to get ideas on what you could be doing better, um, but also what, yeah, what we'll be looking for when we come to do audits. Uh, many of them may seem relatively simple and straightforward, um, but you'd be surprised at where we might have really good governance processes and procedures at the highest level of, of the, at the entity. But when we go down to the project or program level, they're not being applied consistency down at that level. So some of the key themes we're seeing so far uh, include having sound policies, strategies, and performance uh, measurement frameworks and compliance tools are really important, and we all know that they're important to have in place. But what's more important is applying those tools and those frameworks um, at all levels consistently across the organisation or having consistent risk-based rules on when you apply them uh, and documenting the decisions and the outcomes um, that they enable or the intelligence that the application provides. So related to this is if we develop performance indicators and we ensure that they link back to that highest level corporate plan and the entity performance measures, um, to be clear on what the overarching governance frameworks of the organisation are and having a clear line of sight between that and the, pro and the project level. And that includes things like staff training materials. So consistency and regularly assuring that consistency helps with efficiency, embedding practice in your organisations and really simplifying processes. Um, there is still much inconsistency across government on how we measure performance and capture and report on the impact that we're having through our programs. So when designing the frameworks for performance and benefits realisation, think about what other agencies are doing, learn from good practice, and think about what tells a story about your agency, its achievement of objectives, and how many measures might help you tell that story given the breadth of your business and the investment level of the investments that's being made. Um, we at the ANAO, as well as you, have access to incredibly rich data, um, both in your own agencies, um, but also from others, from other sources. Uh, and it's really important to use that data to inform decision making, to make improvements in designs and policies and programs. Uh, we sort of call it evidence-based policy making. So the ANO's primary principle in conducting an audit is evidence, and we need documented evidence to support claims of good process or decision making and how you've used data to, to create an evidence base. Um, that comes through records, good records management. Uh, records, as Rona mentioned, can come in a variety of forms. It can be paper, electronic records, emails. Um, and so record your decisions, not just your spending or your final policy decisions, but what led you to get to the final position that you're in and how you're going to ensure that that decision is then implemented and how will you know that you did it successfully. Uh, risk management frameworks, uh, again, really great to have in place and most of them have a, at some level, but they're only useful if they re reflect the risk appetite of your organisation. Uh, the mitigation strategies outlined um, will be put into action and the risks are being actively monitored and updated as a situation of changes. So risk management frameworks are great, but they've got to be actively managed. Uh, the th next one is be a learning organisation. If we don't capture and share what's working well and what is not working well and what we did to address problems and whether it worked, um, how do we ensure that others in the organisation are not making those same mistakes? or reinventing the same wheel, or not operating as efficiently and effectively as they could be. Uh, related to this is if we invest in a new improvement, a new program or a new policy, what baseline are we using to compare any future benefits realised against so that we can really capture that impact? Um, so the largest number of insights that, that, we've, that we've seen so far since we started doing this in July really relate to governance and risk management. Uh, and the other one is performance and impact measurement. Policy and program design processes could also use a little improvement, 
um, as well as procurement and documenting the evidence for how we intend to and did achieve value for money. Uh, so I encourage you to look out for that first quarterly insights report in around the middle of December, it's said in about a week or so. Uh, and I'll just invite Rona back to the stand just to give you some final wrap up comments uh, and any final questions that, that you might have. Thanks. So, thanks very much. Um, you've been a very, very quiet group, um, which is not my experience as a Deputy Secretary with CFOs. Um, I always reflect on executive boards of management and CFOs tend to be quite vocal in those, but here you are. Did anyone have a reflection or a question on anything that they might have not had a chance over the break or um, not uh, in the room? Well, let me wrap up for you. Um, so, like, follow us on Twitter. Um, I know we're not that cool, um, but uh, if it's the easiest way, uh, other than subscribing to our website, to keep track of what we're doing. Um, as Lisa says, in every performance audit report now, there'll be an appendix or a learnings from this audit. Um, so if you're doing a big procurement in your organisation and someone else, we've just reported on someone else's procurement, have a look and see what they did well and not so well and don't do the not so well yourself. I think the Auditor General's view on procurement is um, pretty much it's going to be baseload work for us in our uh, performance auditing. Um, last year, the... Uh, Commonwealth contracting value on Austender was $47.4 billion. Um, that's a lot of taxpayers' money, and there are pretty clear rules in the CPRs. The one that uh, people don't adhere to other than record keeping, and I sound like a broken record, but it is a, a failing uh, we observe constantly, is the value for money uh, aspect of procurement. So if you uh, are not getting competitive uh, proposals and you don't have a benchmark, you might have a problem. Um, if you do follow us on Twitter or our website, and you can follow just your portfolio too, if you're really interested in your portfolio, what's happening, um, but you can follow more broadly. Um, one thing that uh, beyond the quarterly insights coming out of our performance audits that you might want to keep an eye on is other insight publications that we are starting to do. So there's two on our website at the moment, and they might be useful for your organisations to think about in your divisions or groups, um, or more uh, into your graduate induction or broader induction. Um, there's one about the history and function of the ANAO. So if, if you've got new people coming into your area, or if we're coming in to do a performance audit, it's about four minutes on our website, and it explains uh, what we do. Um, the other one that relates to the work that Michael's doing um, is the implementation of the PGPA. So that one's about six minutes, um, a summary of our insights and learnings on corporate planning, performance statements and risk management. Um, they're little infographics that have a narration, really easy to sit and watch, um, and they'll give you some, some key points. So keep an eye out for those as well. We'll do those from time to time. Um, Michael didn't, it, auditors don't really sort of blow their own trumpet, but one of the things in Audit Report 58 on performance statements that might be useful to you and to your audit committee is the publication of the templates that we used behind the auditing in AFP and agriculture. Um, we chose to publish them because those PGPA type audits are uh, really about assisting um, the APS uh, and the public sector more generally to get it right. So what you can see in the appendices to the report number 58 from this year is the templates that we populated through the collection of evidence and the questions that we asked against the criteria. So if that helps you with your audit committee, um, it's, there to be, it's there to be leveraged. For example, if I was a deputy secretary in a department, I might reproduce that template and through my assurance process in my organisation, actually test to see whether we're hitting the bar that's set against the RMG. All the stuff that's in that template meets the RMG on performance statements. 
Um, in terms of the, those of you that are sort of turned on by the technical um, and some of the standards and, and things that Jane talks about, um, hopefully later this week or early next week, um, we're going to publish a speech that the Auditor General made last week on the challenges of achieving quality in a standard-based approach to auditing in the public sector. So some of the points he makes in that speech are how the public sector is trying to adopt private sector accounting and auditing standards and what a dilemma that can be and what some of his views are on that. So um, that speech was made to the Australian National Centre for Audit and Assurance Research at ANU last week. So that one's going up um, later this week or early next week. The slides and notes and possibly uh, the video of this event uh, will be available on our, our website after we publish the end of year report. So we need to table our end of year report in Parliament before we put up uh, a lot of information out of due deference to the Parliament. So we're aiming for mid-December um, for the end of year report. Uh, so just keep an eye out for that. Lastly, um, as I said uh, in my opening remarks, watch out tomorrow for our information report on uh, Oztender, um, the, uh, the slice and dice of Oztender data. Um, it's a different style. It's not an audit. It's an information report, but some of the things that we've done in there graphically, you'll be able to see where we'd like to go in the future with other work that um, Jocelyn's leading. Thank you very much um, for coming today, for making the time, and for those of you who are streaming live, thank you very much for participating. Um, we do welcome your feedback. Um, hopefully you get value out of these opportunities, and I'd like to thank my senior team also for making the time to come and speak to you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.